I'd like you to go back, maybe to your childhood, to a time when you were absolutely happy. There was nothing on your mind. When you could spend hours just watching the rain or a puppy chasing its tail. Can you remember that? And what it felt like? Now go back to the very first time you fell in love. I know there's a lot of smiles, so you can remember the very first time you fell in love. Do you remember how the colors were brilliant? When you felt incredible caring for the newspaper vendor or the cabbie who took you to where you wanted to go? When you could almost hug the homeless person on your path? when the rainbows were incredibly colorful and brilliant? Yes? How would it be like to go back to that? You know, skeptics tell you that you cannot live in the innocence of childhood or the tempo of youth's first love. But I'm going to suggest to you that you can. And not only can you, but it is incumbent upon you to be there. Because if not, you're doing a grave disservice to yourself. And even more, it's when you are there that you can help everyone around you be the best that they can be. And also begin their own journey to that space. Do you folks remember Galileo? Now, Galileo got into a spot of trouble a few centuries ago. Any, everybody remember that? Do you remember why Galileo got into a spot of trouble? Well, Galileo got into a spot of trouble a few centuries ago because he postulated Maybe the sun does not move around the earth. Maybe the earth moves around the sun, right? Well, each one of us is absolutely convinced Galileo got it wrong. The earth does not move around the sun. It revolves around us personally. I'm actually not kidding. I'm being deadly serious. And I invite you to think about something. I invite you to think about how, no matter what happens, we very quickly bring it down to, what's the impact on me? Do we or do we not do that? Think about it. You know, your spouse gets a great job offer. You think, gee, how is this going to affect our relationship? Your boss leaves the company. And you think, who's the new person going to be and what's my relationship going to be with that person? Or possibly, am I going to get promoted or is it that turkey down the hall? <laughs> you know, your daughter drops out of high school and begins an in-depth exploration of controlled substances. <laughs> and you think, what are they going to think about my parenting? Even when we're feeling altruistic, this comes in. Oh my God, horrible tragedy, earthquake in Nepal, second earthquake in Nepal, I've got to do something about it. And you call the toll-free number to make a contribution. And very quickly you go to, how dare they put me on hold for so long? Right? No matter what happens, we have an incredible ability to bring it down to what's the impact on me. That's what I mean when I say we live in a me-centered universe. We've been indoctrinated into it. Here's one of the sad things about living in a me-centered universe. If that's where you spend the vast majority of your time, 
you are going to live, by and large, a mediocre existence, punctuated by flashes of pleasure, but essentially unfulfilling. That's, that's just the way it is. It comes with the territory. The only way that you're going to be able to break out of that into the vision I laid out for you is if you can be part of a cause which is much bigger than you are, a cause which brings a greater good to a greater community. And you have tremendous flexibility in defining both the greater good and the greater community. But if you don't find something that's bigger than you are and which does such a service to a larger group, you're not going to be able to start reaching the vision I mentioned. Now, the bad news that is, is that we're so indoctrinated into living in a me-centered universe that it's very difficult for us to break out. The good news is that even a very modest stride that we make in that direction will make a huge impact on your life. Medieval England, site of a great cathedral being constructed. And the architect was moving to the scene of the construction, and he came across three people, all of whom were doing the same thing. There was a big block of stone, and they were taking a smaller block of stone, putting it on the big block of stone, and beating it with a hammer till it broke. And he asked the first person, what are you doing? The man said, can you see? I'm breaking stones. Why are you doing it? Because I get paid a hip and off the day. And the second man said, I'm helping build the wall behind me. And the third man said, I'm helping build a great cathedral. And when it is done, people are going to come from all over the world and they will be inspired. And I will have had a small role in making that happen. And 20 years from that date, the man who was breaking rocks was dead. He no longer had the strength to break rocks, and he stopped. The person who was helping build the wall behind him was living a life of desperate poverty. But the person who was helping build a cathedral, and he, by the way, was the only person who recognized the architect, so he said, truth be told, I don't like doing this. It's back-breaking labor, and I can get better wages for less effort. Will you teach me to build a cathedral? Well, he was on his way to building his first cathedral. I can't tell you what is the cathedral that you are going to build. That is something that only you can define for yourself. But I can tell you that if you don't define it for yourself, you're going to live a mediocre, meaningless life. It comes with the territory. I remember I was speaking to a group of very senior executives at a Fortune 25 firm. And must have been about 55 people in the room, and every single one of them ran a country, and some ran multiple countries. And a new product had been introduced, which hadn't quite failed, but sales were not as, were not as expected. And there was a restructuring underway, so they knew that of the people in the room, some of them would not be present in the room the next year around, and the only thing they didn't know is which of them would not be present. So undercurrents of tension, typical big company scenario. And I asked them to take 30 seconds to think about what they did and why they came to work in the morning. And they did, and they came up with things like, you know, that new product has not yet been introduced in my region, so I have to make sure that sales are better than global averages. Or we just made an acquisition in my country, and I want to make sure that the acquisition goes smoothly. And I said, if that is why you get up in the morning, you're either burnt out or heading towards burnout. 
you know, here's this man, young guy, relatively young, he's in his 50s, and he's had a heart attack. And it is the stent that you manufacture that give him his normal life back. Here's this beautiful girl, went through the windshield in a car accident. And it is the sutures that you manufacture that give her her looks back. Go meet the man. Go visit the girl in the hospital. See how important they are in the ecology of their family and their small circle. That is why you get up in the morning. And if that is why you get up in the morning and come to work, all of the problems that you bothered about are minor bumps in the road. But if that is not why you get up in the morning, any one of them could be a major derailment. And what I was surprised by is how many of them came up to me individually and privately afterwards to say, Professor Rao, we really needed to hear that. It's so easy to forget. And that's important for you because every day you can either build a cathedral or you can break rocks. And remember, for those of you who are entrepreneurs or executives or parents, a big chunk of the cathedral that you are building is helping others decide that they want to build their own cathedrals. That is your role. I want to talk to you about one of the most famous scientists in the world. And he's really famous. I'm sure all of you have heard of him. His name is Albert Einstein. Now, when we think of Albert Einstein, and we revere him greatly, we are primarily thinking about his scientific achievements. You know, this is the person who discovered the, or formulated the special theory of relativity, and then the general theory of relativity, and it completely upended our notions of time and space and gravity. And then he discovered the photoelectric effect for which he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Einstein won the Nobel Prize for discovering the photoelectric effect, not for the theory of relativity. So really, really great scientists. But few of us know that in addition to being a great scientist, Einstein actually had a pretty deep understanding of the human predicament and the human being's role in the universe. Now, I happened to start off as a physics major, so I studied the theory of relativity, and I did find it intellectually challenging. I wasn't good enough to understand it in detail, but enough of it to know this was a brilliant, brilliant piece of uh, thought extension. But it never had any direct impact upon my life. And I'm sure if you think about it, you'll say, okay, theory of relativity, it's kind of nice, but I don't understand it, and it certainly has no impact on my day-to-day -day existence, correct? But Einstein said something else, which is very profound, and it will have a direct impact on your life. And Einstein posed a question, and I'm going to relay that to you just now. And that question was, it was a statement actually, the most important decision you will ever make in your life is, is the universe friendly? The most important decision you will ever make in your life is, is the universe friendly? friendly. And this is profound. There are people who believe that the universe is unfriendly and the sole purpose of the universe is to frustrate us. So for example, if we're going to an important meeting and we're running late, the universe will arrange a traffic jam and will arrange for it to be a really hot day 
and will arrange for your air conditioning to break down. There are such people. Do you all know some of them? I see a number of heads nodding, so you, you probably know some of them. They are few in number. The vast majority of us believe that the universe doesn't know we exist and couldn't care less. You know, here we are, we're going around, we're doing our thing, and there's the universe going around doing its thing, and it doesn't know we exist. Some of the times it seems as though the universe is working with us. Some of the times it seems that the universe is working against us, but it's random. And by and large, we're indifferent, unknowing, uncaring, walking on parallel paths which never meet, and the universe doesn't know about us. And that is the world the vast majority of us live in, right? But what if that weren't true? What if the universe did know about you, and the universe was friendly and well disposed towards you? Now, friends don't shaft friends, do they? Nah, they don't. So if friends don't shaft friends, and the universe was your friend, then what if something bad happens to you, or something that you would have labeled bad? Is there the slightest possibility that what you think is bad might not actually be bad, but exactly what you needed at this stage of your life? Think about it. If you're a child, what do you want? If you're a child, you want a tub of ice cream, correct? But what does a wise parent give you? Fruits and vegetables. You don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream. And it's only much later when you have a different level of understanding and maturity that you can say, boy, am I glad I didn't get a tub of ice cream. What if with your present level of maturity and understanding, this thing that happened, which you don't like, was exactly what you needed? Now think about this. Even if the universe was not friendly, if you believed the universe was friendly, your life would be immeasurably improved. Correct? Yes? That's why Einstein said the most important decision you can ever make is, is the universe friendly? Now, just because you can intellectually understand that a model is superior doesn't necessarily mean that you can adopt it. But once you intellectually recognize that this is a superior model, there are steps that you can take to adopt it. And one step which I'm going to share with you right now is to look for signs that the universe is friendly. And there is a corollary to that. If the universe is friendly to you, then you have to be friendly back to the universe. And the universe is all of the peoples who are around you. Your colleagues, your customers, your vendors, your bosses, your family. So you will be friendly to them. And sharing this model is one of the biggest favors that you can do to them. I'm going to conclude with a story that I like. There are many versions of it. It's a Native American story, but I like the version that I'm about to share with you. There was this youth who was about to take his place with the adults of the tribe, and the medicine man was counseling him. And the medicine man told him, there is this dog, friendly, loving, kind, intelligent. And there is this wolf, malvolent, fierce, vicious, cruel. And the wolf and the dog are both inside you. And the wolf and the dog are fighting. And the youth said, which one's going to win? And the medicine man said, whichever one you feed. Now think about that. In each one of us, there are altruistic, 
let's do good and save the world impulses. And in each one of us, there are, let me get what I can as quickly as I can, and the devil take the hindmost impulses. And how our life turns out to be is which one do we feed? Do you have a colleague or a co-worker who comes up to you and says, you know, this is terrible, our boss did this again, and this is a lousy company to work for, and you say, yes, I agree, and you think that's bad? Let me tell you what happened to me. And your tail tops his tail. And you go back to work, and you never realize that you have fed the wolf both in yourself and the other person. But if instead you said, hey, that's true. Is there anything we can do to make the situation better? So let me leave you with this thought. Every time you have a reaction, interaction with any person, just ask yourself, am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Thank you. <laughs>